most welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now, if my uh, remarks eerily uh, reflect what Chris said earlier, it wasn't because we talked at all. So we'll see to what extent we're congruent and incongruent. Now, you know, a central objective of biomedical research is really um, learning how to prevent, diagnose, treat and cure human disease. I think we're all, that's really one of the stated objectives of uh, biomedical research. Because you can't fix something if you don't know, understand how it works, and you don't know what is broken. And so that is sort of a fundamental premise. Since its inception, NH research has been focused on understanding basic biology um, using many species humans much less frequently because of, as Chris said, the costs and difficulties of studying people. Uh, with the advent of the tools of molecular biology and genomics, NIH research has become highly reductionist, uh, how, looking at how molecular interactions bring about physiology, and that, that's how some things work, so that's really important to learn. And this approach has um, served biomedicine very well, bringing about an explosion of knowledge about fundamental biological processes. So compared to where we were in the 70s, there's no comparison. It's amazing. Basic biomedical uh, discoveries are the substrate, then, by which drug discovery or medical product discovery and development grow up from. And many of these new insights are picked up by pharmaceutical companies or device companies that seek to um, uh, invent drugs that might re uh, engage the newly discovered potential targets that the basic science found. And other, um, other discoveries attempted by academics who may um, initiate the work in their labs and then spin off a small company. And so we all know this story. That's how this all starts. Over time, the, there are tens of thousands of candidate drugs discovered. And th these are then winnowed down, as Chris described, to the most promising via animal model work and in vitro evaluation. And they approach the preclinical space. So this huge funnel w w narrows down and approaches this space. And I was asked to talk about, from FDA's point of view, what does NIH do? So. So this is where FDA gets involved in this preclinical space. And um, so um, we have to um, set the safety and the testing standards for first in humans. So in, before any, any new type of invention gets tested in people, FDA's job is to make sure it's adequately been tested for safety and its various performance before it goes in there. Um, then subsequently, candidates that are able to pass the preclinical evaluation become investigational products, drugs or devices or biologics, and undergo evaluation in people, finally, uh, to see if their performance meets, um, merits them being put in, on the market. So that long stage of clinical testing, people will say, oh, it's phase one, two. Really, you're just evaluating them to see, do they perform well enough, does the juice uh, worth the squeeze, because there are always going to be side effects and harm and costs and so forth. Now, if you think of this whole process as a funnel, and Chris showed the, the data, but it, way up here, these tens of thousands of compounds coming out of discovery and out of the uh, um, biomedical research, and gets down to a thread. And so I think so some of the questions that were talked about earlier about productivity and E-Room's law, until very recently, this is very interesting, that for drugs, the number of new entities, new molecular entities, we call them new products that came out, okay, over time has been steady for decades. And you have to see that the pharmaceutical industry has grown like tremendously. So there's been this huge uh, effort, and uh, but production was stable. It actually dropped in the 2000s. Now we may be up at a new high, uh, and there may be stability there, but it, it still is not very high compared to the productivity many decades ago. So I think that's true, although the, how to attribute the cost is different. So subsequently, candidates that can pass, and um, they have this other um, you know, testing has to go on. Now, I'm not privy uh, to the dollar figures, but I would say the NIH enterprise is heavily weighted toward the um, input of the um, 
funnel. So most of the NIH in, uh, effort is working on that funnel. And um, with a relatively small amount of uh, expertise on the pathway to market. So NIH kind of drops off there very significantly. Much of the cost of drug development is driven by the failure rate. Again, you already heard this from Chris. Um, of candidates entering the clinical phase. So the costs before that aren't too extreme, but once you enter the clinical, we're talking about real money. And failing in the clinic is really um, very expensive. Only about one in 10 from entering the clinic get onto the market, and fewer of them are market successes. So, you know, if you still, if you can't make money, even if you get a product on the market, you're still not going to uh, be, stay in business. Thus, the cost of all these failures weighs heavily on the few successes that actually make it onto the market to recoup the cost of running this entire process. So what benefit does FDA receive from our NIH uh, enterprise? Well, clearly, without the um, foundational knowledge of, bi of biomedical science and the advances of that knowledge, the enterprise wouldn't advance very much at all. So the NIH enterprise is necessary for this to advance. It is not sufficient, however. Um, <clears throat> NIH also generates, um, you know, a huge um, knowledge generating machine that moves the field ahead every year with all this. Uh, and they also uh, generate scientists who work in pharmaceutical labs, uh, as well as uh, in academia, as well as at the FDA. So NIH has a huge, their grant program has a huge training role in bringing about the next generation of scientists. And the NIH itself also has a huge group of disease experts who help the FDA all the time in their various technical expertise on disease. So what's missing? Um, despite the existence of NCATS, NIH has really uh, not, I would say, embrace translational science, right? And this is the kind of knowledge needed to um, really uh, hone that funnel down properly, efficiently, to pick the winners, to decrease the failure rate, to um, have drug development or any medical product development be informative. So at the end of the day, not only have you picked a winner, but you know a lot about how to use that winner, who it should be used in, what dose, and all these sorts of things. That's translational science. And Chris talked a lot about that, so I won't go into it in great detail. <clears throat> but um, that's really important if we're going to improve access to patients, if that's what we're talking about here, and decrease overall costs of this enterprise. This science, and you already heard this, but I'm sorry, Chris, this science is usually team science, okay? It's not the artisanal single investigator uh, effort that is held up as the gold standard in the basic enterprise. And um, it's not only team science, and Chris also alluded to this, it's expensive science. You know, I've been before Congress, so we run um, biomarker qualification efforts, and I've been before Congress, and why haven't you qualified more biomarkers? Well, because it's hard to determine whether a biomarker really stands for anything, right? And you have to spend money on it, and you have to do science on it, and you can't do it in mice, right? You have to do it in people. If you do it in mice, then you have a mouse biomarker. You do not have a human biomarker, right? And so, um, you know, um, but there is not a space for this. There is not grant funding for this. This is not considered a prestigious or academic activity, and yet it is essential because this funnel continues to grow because really the basic biomedical enterprise is extremely successful in, is crisp, in identifying disease and, you know, understanding some of the pathophysiology of disease and so forth. It's the intervention that is tough, right? How do we prevent? How do we diagnose? How do we treat? And so forth. So team science uh, enables us to better predict and evaluate the performance of candidates in the relevant species, humans, as I've said. Um, it involves activities such as qualifying biomarkers, developing outcome measures. How do you know if the people are better? 
you have to measure something, right? And how do you measure it? Well, there's something called measurement science <laughs> that allows you to measure things. But you have to go through a lot of science. That science is not honored, okay, by the basic research enterprise. None of these sciences are. And that, like, therefore, they are not honored in academia very much and so forth. Five minutes I got. I'm really closing in. <laughs> okay. Although I could get quite wound up about this if you let me. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll try to tone it down here. <laughs> But also clinical trial techniques, you know, we do much, Chris was saying what NCATS has done, then that is decreasing um, cost, time and cost of uh, initiating trials. I talked to somebody last night who's running some platform trials in, in Alzheimer's disease, and they've been able to complete those times, unlike the NIH record of 50% non-completion, they've completed their t trials on time, on budget, because they have a platform trial set up and they can just uh, put candidates in and run them through because all this administrative stuff he talked about is already done. We've worked out the outcome measures, people have been trained, and so we can do candidate after candidate rather than having a separate trial for each one. Uh, Bayesian methodologies, adaptive designs, all these things could help us, but they require an academic base. Okay, so where, I always ask, it's so important, we're humans, right? Where are the departments of clinical trial designs in the universities? Where are they? Where is the expertise in biomarkers uh, and, and so forth? You know, it doesn't exist because it isn't recognized, these fields, as, as how critical they actually are to evaluating this huge mass coming out of basic biology, which is fabulous, but we don't know what it means, you know. And we know most of it probably won't work <laughs> per, the, per Chris's slides, right? And then um, I would add that, um, you know, tra translational uh, science doesn't involve, and this comes to some of what you're asking me to talk about, I don't think NIH or academia necessarily should develop individual products. That's not what I'm talking about. Just as, just as the basic science doesn't develop individual products, okay, they develop, they find pathways, they find targets, they understand physiology, pathophysiology. Same with translational science. It can understand um, how to evaluate various candidates, not develop specific candidates. What has been done is this whole translational realm for 30 years was left to the pharmaceutical industry. And they were supposed to do this. Well, they don't share information. <laughs> and, so, and so that field has not advanced the way it should because it's been kept where knowledge was gained in trials, in learning, in these animal models, it, it has been kept behind the walls of the companies because they're, that is, they're developing assets, specific products. So I know I see I have 1.44 minutes and I'm ready to go. <laughs> so um, I think NIH or some other entity that there needs to be funding for this type of science that needs to be recognized as a critical scientific link in the chain. So, um, uh, so it, in addition, medical product development itself requires other types of expertise that Chris alluded to that you might consider translational science, but not necessarily like how to lyophilize something properly or whatever, may or may not. I mean, that is industrial um, type of activities that also need a uh, knowledge base, and we have been working on that with Nimble, with uh, NIST, uh, to uh, improve the pharmaco pharmacologic sciences under pharmaceutics and other sciences underlying uh, how you make products and, and bring them to market. And I don't think NIH contains that kind of expertise, and they often thus get into trouble when they actually try to develop products themselves. But filling in the huge gap in translational uh, science um, that we have today is probably our only opportunity to, to lower, overall lower the costs of medical product development and improve access, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you.